can't stand standing behind podiums because I'm short. So, so I'm going to just stand over here. I hope all of you can see me. If not, there's plenty of seats over there. You can move around. Um, so anyway, thank you very much, Bev, for all your really you know wonderful investigative work. Um, a lot of what we have, a lot of the files and interesting memorandum are due to Bev having taken the carriage to put them up on websites and uh, withheld um, you know lawsuit threats and all sorts of things that were going on. So we, we really owe a, a great debt of thanks to Bev and some of the other people have really been promoting this. Were any of you involved in the um, the Computer Ate My Vote Day? Did you protest on that or sign the petition? We had over 350,000 signatures were de delivered to various state legislatures um, all over the country. I personally was standing on the steps of the uh, the uh, state capitol in New Jersey and we delivered 20,000 signatures by New Jerseyans. It represents about 1% of the uh, American citizens and um, this is just shows the level, that was just in those petitions, shows the level of understanding and enthusiasm that people have about the problems that we're, we're already seeing on an election by election basis with these new voting systems. So I want to talk about this. For those of you who don't know me, I've been involved with this for 15 years. In 1989, I uh, lived in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and uh, they were thinking about getting these newfangled voting machines over there. And I really thought, you know, I don't think this is a good idea. And went home, found a New Yorker article written by a guy by the name of Ronnie Duggar. By the way, he has a new article in uh, this week's issue of The Nation. Check it out. It's really, it's online. You can check it out. Really great investigative journalism. So he's been tracking this stuff for decades, the type of stuff that was going on. Managed to convince the uh, county commissioners in Bucks County not to buy the machines. They're still using their old lever machines. And they called me after 2000 to thank me for <laughs> convincing them to stay with that old uh, sort of passe um, technology that they're still using in New York also, by the way. So that type of thing, um, sort of on an individual basis, got me involved with looking at this. I am a computer scientist, unlike Bev, I don't have any grandchildren that I know of, unless <laughs> there's some cloning going on. But, <laughs> but uh, the, um, my background has been in computer science. I've been working in um, the industry for around 20 20 years and a lot of my work has been in um, real-time microsystems and also in computer security so this is a, a real offshoot of that type of work that I had been doing um, so anyway it was very easy for me and again being so, somewhat small in stature and looking somewhat nerdish um, I can go into not anymore because they all know who I am but I used to be able to go into voting machine companies and you know oh what's that oh, open up the bag show me the thing and then point out all the microprocessors in the back of the machines. And by the way, why do you need five microprocessors inside of a voting machine? Who the heck knows? Anyway, this is the type of this is the type of stuff that I was able to investigate. Now, unfortunately, I get thrown out of places because they know who I am. But that's all right. I still can make a very good um, representation of you know what's going on. When now we sometimes get court orders to go into this. So what um, what's actually happened has been a huge debate that has broken out in the industry as a result of all of this and they're pitting now us, us, the computer scientists um, community and engineers who have spoken out against this and they're saying that we're un-American, we're unpatriotic for having pointed out these flaws in our election systems and so in a very expensive lobbying group, which by the way um, Bev was able to observe the formation of, what did they, they paid, the vendors paid $50,000 a piece to join the yeah. $200,000 a piece. And then five minutes decide this. Okay, so these guys joined these joined forces in this line of you. By the way, we all do this, you know, pro bono or just, you know, off of our, you know, own personal funds to do this. So I don't get any pay for doing this. But these guys had this huge lobbying group, which is a, a, a adjunct of the Information Technology Association of America. So now they come out with these statements. And here's some of the statements. These are just from the recent press. July 19th, just a few days ago, um, they said that a recent ITA survey showed that 77% of registered voters are unconcerned about the security of e-voting systems. But what about the other 23% that are concerned about it? So then he says, and this I love, this is the latest in the way that this works, is that Miller said that critics who claim to be concerned about the security of e-voting systems are really using the 
issue to push a political agenda on behalf of the open source community. Okay, so obviously I am an open source enthusiast. Not really, actually, as it turns out, but but they think that I am, and those of us who are doing this, but you don't write any code, so you're not advocating that. No, I don't think so. So then they go on to say the following. It's not about voting machines. It's not about voting machines at all. I've only studied this for 15 years and got a PhD in this because I really, it wasn't about voting machines. It's a religious war about open source software versus proprietary software. Now, I founded a company. I have a consulting firm, Notable Software. You see a little logo down the bottom. And I'm into it for proprietary software. Stuff. I mean, yeah, you can get patents and copyrights. If you have trade secrets, well, then that should be for Coca-Cola. But, you know, for software, as far as I'm concerned, we have ways of protecting that that can be proprietary. And you're welcome to be a capitalist, and you can sell your stuff. I really don't care. But basically what he's saying is that if you're a computer scientist and you think that open source software is the solution to everything, I've always thought that, by the way, not, and then you hate electronic voting machines. But if you're a person who believes believes that proprietary software and open source software can both be reliable, then you don't hate electronic voting machines. That's really nice of him to characterize it in that way. Now, if he'd come to any of my talks, and in fact, I know he was at one of my talks, because when they announced the ITAA, their, you know, this little club opening up, they were announced it at the NIST conference at the National Institute of Standards and Technologies in Maryland. So people were nodding, maybe you were even there. They announced it at the Maryland conference, and I was there, and I was giving a talk, and I show these types of slides. So if he comes to any of my talks, which he has been at, I don't know if he stays awake during them, he would have seen this slide where I have always said, and it is in my writing, that open source cannot provide sufficient verification and validation assurances. And in fact, Ken Thompson, the famous guru from AT&T, Bell Laboratories, said the famous statement in his paper, Reflections on Trusting Trust, which incidentally has been linked on my website for about three years. But that's okay. Obviously, I'm an open source fanatic. But he's what he said in 1984 and won an award. He said, you can't trust code that you do not totally create yourself, especially code from companies that employ people like me, like AT&T. Well, obviously, their stock's not doing too well, but what can we say? No amount of source level verification or scrutiny will protect you from using untrusted code. So I'm not an open source enthusiast, although I think that open source is great but I'm not that enthusiastic about it. Now, what I find is really interesting, and if any of you are checking the news feeds, and in fact, you can just, I don't even carry around business cards anymore, because all you type is into Google, Mercury and voting, and you don't have to spell Mercury correctly, and you'll get my homepage. So, so I'm so famous now, so great. So <laughs> it saves me a lot of money with business cards. But in any event, what, what, if you check today in Google News, because I was over at uh, Black Hat, and I announced this challenge, and I said I was going to announce it at Black Hat and at DEF CON. At DEF CON, I'm giving you the details of the challenge, so you're going to hear about this challenge. Um, but basically, I'm reiterating Michael Shamus' challenge. So you'll see, if you go into Google News, type in Mercury Voting, you're going to see, uh, as of 11 o'clock this morning, there were 30 news feeds on me. There's probably even more. So they're jumping all over, and I understand CNN was rolling the Mercury Challenge on the scroll today, which is like way cool. So, so the last time I got on the CNN scroll was when I called it N style of voting. So that was a couple years ago. Anyway, so, so, they, so, so what I'm doing, what I'm saying is that I'm reissuing the schedule. By the way, if you got this brochure, this is the official brochure. If you didn't get it, there's some by the door and I have a few extras left. So it would be good to autograph them. Also, we'll autograph them. So anyway, um, what, what Michael Seamus, a computer scientist and also an attorney, has two, de two degrees, um, and he, he is at Carnegie Mellon University. And he happened to be on Jim Lehrer's News Hour a couple months ago on May 5th. And he made the following statement. He said, for years, in fact, about six years, I've had a challenge posted on the internet that there's a $10,000 prize for anyone who can tamper undetectably with a DRE, that's a direct recording electronic voting machine. Now, by the way, about 30% of the voting systems will, or people will be using these DRE-style machines um, in this November election. And he then says the following, no one has taken me up on this because it's not possible to do it. Well, that's really interesting. Now, we've heard a whole bunch of examples here of how it is possible to do it, but he still doesn't 
doesn't believe this. So I think that these are fighting words. So I have now thrown out the gauntlet. So the gauntlet is as follows, and this is what the Associated Press said uh, yesterday, actually. So they reported me saying the following. I'm tired of hearing members of the election community say that there no problems have occurred with electronic voting systems when every election there's plenty of newspaper reports of glitches. When, when in fact they say, when these votes are missing, as you'll see later in my slides, when votes go missing, they insist, and I have them even say this in court, and they meaning election officials, vendors, that people by the droves, by the thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of people, even nationwide, by the millions of people, go into the voting machines, deliberately do not choose any candidates, and then leave. So I find this rather preposterous. But in fact, this is what they assert. And then they say all sorts of reasons for that, that they want to prove they're a citizen by doing this. I find this rather preposterous. But in any event, they make these statements, they make these allegations that these missing votes, I call them vanishing votes, the votes that vanish in these systems, they say that it, these are deliberately vanished votes, that voters go in, don't make a choice, and then press the, you know, cast vote button and then leave. I don't believe this. I believe, and you'll see this in my data as you see it going along. So I issue, I'm issuing this challenge because I'm responding to his bet, and he is, you know, as I said, he's promised this $10,000 um, to anyone who can hack into a voting machine undetected. So that's what the challenge is. The challenge is to hack into a voting machine undetected. Now, Bev has already given a whole host of back doors and ways that you can do it. Go on monster.com, get a gig, do this thing, and I'm going to tell you how you're going to be able to identify yourself so that we can make sure you get the $10,000. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, now, you have to understand, I'm not telling anybody to do anything illegal, okay? Maybe Michael Seamus is telling you to do something illegal, but I'm not, okay? Now, I'm saying that his challenge was impossible because if you do it in, in the fashion where you take a machine and then you examine it, you insert this thing such as it's undetectable, we all know how to do that. Again, this was on that reflections on trusting trust, put in the compiler, the compiler the compiler, we can buy the code, etc. Those of you who are hackers know what I'm talking about. But in any event, that sort of stuff that you can do, you don't have to be an insider to do that, okay? So, or you'd have to have access to the machine. Now, you could have access to the machine and actually do that. But what he's saying is that you're only going to have to do this without having access to the machine. Well, it's not really possible, but he, that's not really his challenge. It's just undetectable. So the point is, is that the, since the industry imposes these restrictive trade secret agreements, you have to find some way of gaining access. Now, you have to do it legitimately, or there's this wireless stuff going on. We'll talk about that a little bit later, too. So there's a whole host of ways that you can do this to gain access to the stuff. I would prefer it if people do this before the election, rather than during the election. And what, I, what I'd really like to see is people actually doing it with code that has been released, and I'll talk about that too. But anyway, so the point is, is that they're not going to offer up the machines. A couple of companies have, but mostly they're not going to offer them up. So you're not going to have a legitimate way of doing it. That would be the real way to prove that this is going. So anyway, yesterday, the Associated Press called Seamus, and he dismissed my criticism. And whatever, it's, you know, academic. So he goes, no one is going to take me up in this challenge. The question of influencing an election is moot because no one could do it without being detected. And then he goes, anybody can hack into anything. I can break into a bank. The question is, are they going to know the money is gone? And I'm going to give you the way that you can prove that, okay? So in any event, so here's the issue. The issue is can you do it that it is undetected, but you also have to prove that you did it. So it's a rather fascinating sort of strange turn of events. But I am a genius, so I have figured out how to do this in the last 24 hours, which I've had no sleep. So, <laughs> so I found this really fascinating. Okay, so here's more reaction. There's a company called Vote Here. It's also mentioned in my press release, and uh, Jim Adler, and I know all these guys, we sit at the same meetings and yell at each other. Anyway, so Vote Here founder Jim Adler said his company published the code, because I mentioned his code in this stuff, to his patented election security software, hoping people would test it. Okay, so he's hoping that people will test it. In fact, that's why I mentioned him, because he said that he wanted people to test it. But then he says, it's not about preventing fraud. This is about detecting fraud. Now, wait a second. 
Don't we want to prevent fraud in the election? No. Apparently, he doesn't care. He just really wants us to detect it. Uh, duh. Okay, that's a little strange, but all right, that's fine. We'll detect it, too. So, so what's interesting is here in Nevada, Nevada, and I think this is wrong. This is from the Associated Press, but I think they got it wrong, actually. I don't believe that Nevada is using the ballot printers in all of its precincts, I believe they're using it in a select few uh, of them. And, but Sequoia Voting Systems is providing these ballot printers. This is Some people may have heard of this Mercury method where it's a touchscreen machine or a DRE machine and then it prints out a ballot next to it. But in any event, um, even though I'm the one who came up with that idea that they now adopted into the machine, they're calling me irresponsible now. So they're saying that this stuff needs to be reviewed by trusted experts in computer security uh, excuse me, I have a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in computer science. But no, I'm not a trusted expert in computer security. And not by technological vigilantes, maybe like the people in this room, some of whom probably also have PhDs in computer science, who want to exploit the technology. Said Alfie Charles, by the way, he's just a tech spokesman for the California-based Sequoia. In any event, what my challenge is, is I'm calling it the put up or shut up challenge. I am sick of these people people making these statements and so now I want to put want them to put their money where their mouth is and they know I'm doing this I answer it right in front of their faces at a conference in Rutgers back at the end of May and so basically the challenge is that hopefully some of you are going to do this and then if they don't give us the $10,000 or whoever does it then we're going to let everybody know and it's going to be broadcast all over all the same news agencies that just broadcast the challenge today so there's a lot of people looking at this. Now I need to define the rules in advance. So he's basically given us the ground rule. The ground rule is it has to be undetectable. So you have to do it, but then afterwards you have to prove that you were the one who did it. And it could be, he doesn't say that it can't be an insider attack. So as far as I'm concerned, if you can get that job from Monster.com and then you can attack it and then demonstrate that afterwards, then I think that's fine. You can also do it as an outsider attack. And you have to provide proof without detection. And here's how I'm suggesting that you do it. You can do it in some variation like this because maybe, since I've now said this, they're going to use some pattern string match, although I don't think they can change their source code at this late date because it had to be certified. So, <laughs> so I've got them on this one. So what I think you want to do is that when we have elections, there's a write-in spot. So instead of voting for president, you write in Donald Duck, okay? Lots of people like to do that just for grins. So what I want you to do is I want you to write in on or whoever does this on a ballot in a write-in. It doesn't have to be for president. It could be for anybody. You know, I want you to write Seamus O's and then you're going to have some special characters that can't be typed from the keyboard, okay? Everybody knows ASCII and Unicode and you can have the smiley face or some Chinese or whatever you want to appear and then we'll, you know, we'll have a way of tracing that back to you. So we'll have to work at that little detail. But as long as it's a special character that can't be typed from the keyboard, we know it didn't come from a voter. It had to come from inside the machine. So we'll say, Seamus is blah, 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 10K, okay? And that's how we're going to prove it. Now, you could come up with other ways, but if you're going to come up with other ways, you're going to have to identify it well in advance. And we have to figure out ways that you can be anonymous so that you don't get to go to jail and get arrested. We haven't worked all those details out yet, but I think we can work it out, okay? So, so but, but in any event, maybe we'll have them deposit it into a Swiss bank account or something. So the point is, is that if Seamus doesn't cough up the 10K after this happens, then we're going to blast this all over the place. Now, no, then I am not saying that if you have this hack and you prove that you have this hack, that this is going to prevent the vendors from doing the famous thing that Bev loves them doing, is that they say, oh, we fixed that. And then they release another version where they say they fixed it, but they didn't really fix it. So it doesn't prevent them from doing that. So don't think that you're going to be solving the problems of democratic elections by doing this. We're just going to like, give it to them. That's all we really want to do. You know, We really want to get the puppy. So the, so the idea is not that we're going to solve problems 
problems of the Democratic elections because they're just going to come out with another release. But hopefully we'll be able to pound them into the ground a couple of times, and that will really help that, with that. Now, the other thing is, is that if you're unsuccessful and you don't hack it, that doesn't mean that these things are secure. As we know, they're not secure. But I would really hope that people will take us up on the challenge and actually do this. Now, who is Michael Seamus? Actually, Michael Seamus was one of the guys who inspired me in a variety of my thinkings on, the, on this whole election business. And he wrote in a conference uh, paper that, in fact, I was the, uh, the chair of the uh, conference session. It was the uh, Computer Freedom and Privacy Conference number three, which is something like in 1993 out in California. And I invited Michael Seamus because he actually was a state examiner for the state of Pennsylvania excuse me, state of Pennsylvania, and also the state of Texas. And he had examined voting machines. He had written a number of really great articles and uh, had demonstrated a number of different things with regard to the security or lack thereof of these voting systems. Excuse me, and in this paper, he had written these six commandments of voting. And he, he said these were not heuristics that were generally available, that were published or anything like that. And nobody ever told him, well, when you examine a voting machine, you have to be concerned with these six commandments. But what he found was that basically the systems had to obey these types of things, or he couldn't really certify them because it was sort of generally understood that these were the things that people were looking for when they were doing the certification. So number one, and by the way, these are in decreasing order of importance. So he felt that the most important thing was that the voter's vote had to be secret because even though there's actually not really a lot in the way of laws or precedents with regard to the secrecy of the ballot, some states have laws with regard to that, but people do expect that their vote is secret. In fact, it's not secret all the time. If you vote in like a caucus where people separate in the room, that's not a secret ballot. The internet primary that was held in Michigan was in fact not a secret ballot. So there's plenty of elections that are not secret. But in general, people expect that they're going to have cast a secret ballot. Now you notice that's number one. Down number four was thou shalt report all votes accurately. So he's not saying that, that it is equally important as reporting all the votes accurately. That's actually way low down on the list. And in between that, there were other such things like not allowing um, voters to vote multiple times, not allowing there to be anything like a receipt where the voter could prove how they voted and, and allow them to sell their vote. Then finally vote, reporting all votes accurately and making sure that the voting system remains operable throughout each election. That doesn't seem to happen a lot. In California, in their, uh, their um, recent primary election, they found that there were some they reported that there were some 36% of machines didn't start up in one county on election day. As it turned out, when the Secretary of State's office investigated, it was more like 50% of the machines didn't start up. So these are the types of things that, that aren't really going on, but again, that's not that important. It's much more important to keep secret ballots than to make sure the voting system is operating through the entire day. And then the interesting thing was this business number six, where it says you have to keep an audit trail to de detect sins against numbers two through four, not the operable thing necessarily, but you can't have your audit trail violate commandment number one. And therein lies the rub. I looked at this for a really long time because I was on the, you know, I was the chair of this panel session and he gave the talk and I kept thinking about it and it took me a while, actually I think it was probably a couple of years before I suddenly realized but there's some inherent problem, there's just some incompatibility between keeping votes completely secret and having an audit trail. Now he's saying that the secrecy is, is paramount, is, is most important, but I actually believe that people really think that all six of these things are actually important. So what I felt was essentially that the emperor has no clothes, that it is not possible to do what these voting system companies actually are saying that they are intending to do. But they are going to have complete auditability and complete anonymity in a fully electronic system. They're selling the stuff saying that they can do that, but there isn't any way to actually provide that. And in fact, that was the seminal part of my doctoral dissertation where I actually demonstrated using computer science theory that it is not possible to have full anonymity and full auditability in a completely electronic system. You have to have some other influences, in other words, those paper ballots or some other way of doing an independent audit in order to do the auditability. But fully electronic, there is actually no way to do that. Hold your question till the end. We'll be glad to answer questions and I want to sort of roll through these. And in fact, 
What I also believe is that the voting system vendors, having had to deal with these people for about 15 years now, what I actually believe is that they know these systems are actually flawed, that they know that sometimes they have negative votes or sometimes they have more votes than there are voters, and they know that sometimes the votes sort of go up and down and that these votes just tend to vanish, and that if we did have an external audit trail that we could compare against the electronic vote tally, that it would show how flawed these systems actually are. And so I believe there was a deliberate act, I didn't believe that until this year, actually. But now, having dealt with as many people as I have, I believe there is a deliberate act on the part of the vendors, the major vendors, not really necessarily the smaller vendors, because some of them are doing audit trails correctly, but on the part of the major vendors and on the part of some members of the election community to make sure there is no independent way to audit these systems, because I think then it would be revealed how flawed these systems actually are. I haven't been able to prove this, but I have enough substantive proof with regard to these back doors that are being provided in the in these um, the, the types of uh, standards that are being written that leads me to believe that those back doors are actually being provided there. So in any event, let me go back a little bit in history and bring us up to where we are today, talk about the types of flaws that can be exploited and give you an opportunity to sort of give some thought to how you would go about hacking the voting system so that you can win the $10,000 prize. Now, the idea of messing around with the ballot box goes way back. This is the, Thomas Nast wrote a, a lot of really, maybe nasty comes out of that name, I don't know. <laughs> he had a lot of nasty cartoons, very famous cartoons. All this stuff's now in the public domain so you can use it. And um, he, he did a lot a lot of stuff about elections, and elections were very corrupt. The idea of ballot boxes going missing and people commandeering them and stuffing ballots and changing things was fairly commonplace in 1876. So now we zoom ahead to the future, and what we basically have is this sort of, as Bev likes to call it, black box, or as I like to call it, Enron style of auditing. Oh, and by the way, Enron, some of the Enron folks, you know, they, they turned into another company, and now they're an offshore Bermuda company called Accenture. Guess what they make? Voting machines. They were actually responsible for the internet voting project that was going to be used by the Department of De Defense to cast ballots overseas by the military and military families in the 2004 election. They have decided not to do that, but that project is not dead. And Accenture, the Enron people, are uh, the people who are helping to create that. In any event, getting back to this, um, this basically is the situation that we have now, so it's basically a trust us type of situ situation. Well, I believe the voters really wanted is that the voters want to know that the ballot is cast and counted as intended. Think, keep thinking about this hacking thing as you go along with this because this gives you the clues as to what is going to be hackable on this. And what the voters want is that the counts and the recounts should be independent, unbiased, reproducible, accurate, and understandable. But that's not what they've gotten. So all of those things that we don't have are those flaws that allow you to have those back doors to go in to hack the voting system. This is what the voters wanted. Um, what I proposed is the concept of the election lotto. Now, it actually could be funded. I think it could be funded by a lottery. You know how on your tax returns, some of you might not even pay taxes, but in any event, on your tax returns, there's that little checkbox, do you want to donate a dollar to the presidential campaign? They should have, do you want to donate a dollar to the election lottery? And then everybody who votes gets a lottery ticket, and then we'll have these statewide uh, awards. But in any event, that went over like a lead balloon. But what I feel is, one of, the, one of the things that the election officials have said is, we can't use paper ballots because it's discriminatory and a lot of people can't deal with them. Now, on these lottery ticket things, if you go to your state, I collect these in different states that I go to. If you go to your state thing, you know, like it's like in a, you know, 7-Eleven convenience store or like maybe at the gas station, they have these little cards method thing is basically slips of paper that the voter would actually see, they verify that that's how they intended to vote, they, they hit a button saying that that is how they intended to vote, and it drops into a sealed ballot box. So that's the Mercury method business. But I actually, even an optically scanned ballot, like sort of getting back to the election lotto, but even an optically scanned ballot is a voter verified paper ballot because the voter sees how they voted, and you do have that piece of paper there that you can then later use to audit the election. So there's a variety of different ways. I want to talk about about that in this talk today, but there's plenty of material on my website. You can catch me later, and I'll be glad to give you a lot of implementations of how that could actually work. Uh, I'll take one more question, then I'm going back to my talk. <laughs>
What happens if you what? What happens if he pays? Then, then great. Then again, we publicize the whole thing that the election has been hacked, and then we all like sort of pray about November. So, and then you see that one of you are wear, is wearing the redefeat Bush button. I've got the bumper stickers, the whole thing. So, you know, so then, so then we have a real important thing on our hands is that we've actually demonstrated that this actually could occur. And I think that that's the most important thing is because these guys are saying, and, and gals, and the election is female, that these people are saying that we can't and hack an election, and I believe that we can, and a number of us believe that we can. Okay, you told me I can talk. Yay, again, back to the election lotto. Okay, so the, election, the whole idea of the election lotto is that you're going to have these things lying around. If you want to create 20 of them, you can create 20 and get 20 bucks from each person that you said you voted for, you know, but then it's your choice as to how you're going to cast it. You can only cast one, you have to go to your precinct and cast it. And when I suggested this, they said, oh, no, we don't want to make voting easy for people to do. Uh, wait a second. And I thought that was the idea of a democracy. Oh no, we don't want it to be easy. That would make it too easy for people to vote. Well, that's really too bad, isn't it? What, what you really want is you want it to be controllable when it's cast. In other words, you want to have it available to everybody, but apparently that's anathema to the way that we run elections, unfortunately, in this country. But we want ballots to be available to everybody. We want people to understand how they do the elections. And then you want to make it difficult to cast it, but not so difficult that you're excluding certain minorities and this type of thing. You want to make it just difficult enough that you can't cast them multiple times. So anyway, that idea went over like a lead balloon. So someone came up, actually a Republican, came up with this idea, which is what, <laughs> what I call, since I'm a computer scientist, the keep it simple and stupid voting machine, which is the Fisher Price voting device. If you can't vote with this, you can't think enough to choose. Oh, that might be discriminatory against the people who can't think, but that's all right. The, uh, the idea is that you to have this sort of, you know, <laughs> plug-in device. And as far as the election law is concerned, actually it's the state's rights how they choose to vote. And if the state wanted to vote by throwing beans into a cup, as long as it was fair to all citizens and all citizens had access to the beans, then that actually is a fair way of running elections. There's absolutely nothing in the election law or in the Help America Vote Act, unlike what people would like you to think, that we have to vote on voting machines. The states can make up their own rules. So I hope that maybe some states will adopt this one. I think it would be cool. In fact, what we unfortunately got, and I really love this cartoon, um, is the following thing. It's, it's basically these guys talking. He said, remember that horrible mess during the Florida vote count where the new paper-use voting machine already being implemented in many counties completely solves the problem? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. There's no awful chads or paper ballots to deal with, just a computer record. So there's absolutely no way to do a recount if the election is closed. And better yet, the software is a trade secret, so no one can check that the votes are recorded correctly. But, but that doesn't even begin to address the real problem. No more records, no more recounts, problem solved. Now you think that this sounds rather blatant, it is a cartoon after all, but in fact there is a con company called NADAP PowerVote, and they're a Dutch company, I've mentioned them in my press release, that right on the website they said, no more messy recounts. The computer will always print out the same thing multiple times. So they're being blatant about this. So, so now we get to this point about recounts. Okay, now again, keep thinking, it's sort of like the magic trick. Keep thinking. <laughs> I, I have seen Penn and Teller a lot of times. They throw my own down, throw it off here. And so, so I don't like to think about the way they do the magic world. They say, keep thinking about this. So it's sort of like this. So keep thinking about this as we're talking about this. You know, recounts, the fact that we don't really have recounts gives you again another back door to be able to work your tricks. Okay? Fully electronic systems do not provide any way for the voter to independently verify that the ballot cast corresponds to the data that was recorded and transmitted. So again, 30% of voters are probably going to be voting on these types of systems this November. So this is basically what we're dealing with, no independent recount. Election officials are given no way to conduct an independent recount since the audit trails that are provided lack any sort of checks and balances. They're just provided by the manufacturer using the software that's in the machine. Recounts are, as, um, as uh, the, one of the congressmen in, in South Florida likes to mention, he calls it um, reprints. And he says that they're not really a recount, it's just a reprint. When you get a recount from these machines, they just push a button and it basically 
basically computer generates another um, image there. And then in the computer industry, we know this as GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. So if the garbage data from your vote data was collected improperly or somehow smished up as we went along, then it's going to be garbage on the way out. And then the vendors also claim that their machines are fail safe. They're not fail safe. We have had them malfunction in actual use during elections and the votes have vanished and when they vanish there's no way to recover the data. So again, these are all sorts of ways that you could hack the election. So you've got a whole host of ways. You don't have to necessarily do the thing that has this, you know, fake thing. But if you manage to do any of these things, you're going to have to prove that you actually did this. But I would say if you do it, then you also want to leave that little message in one of the ballots. So in any event, um, here's some of the vulnerabilities. And I said the vulnerabilities are really based on this inherent inequity between the full audit trail and the anonymity. And so basically what we have is inherent in the nature of all computers, including those used for ballot preparation and vote tallying, are aspects that can be intentionally or accidentally used to subvert the systems. Um, the, infam the, the infamous denial of service attack, the election occurs over a short time frame and it has to be running during that time frame. That's the high intensity period. So if you create a denial of service attack, such as happened with these batteries some in this, some counties in California where the batteries, for some reason, weren't charged up and so people couldn't vote for four hours and they were denied um, access to the voting. They were told to come back later, but some of them couldn't do that. So it is a high-risk target. So if you can create a denial of service attack and then demonstrate that you did a denial of service attack, as far as I'm concerned, you should also win the $10,000. But anyway, you're going to have to figure out how to do this and then also be identified as having done it. Um, as I said, the traditional forms of auditing is prevented or precluded by the anonymity requirement. And the earlier forms, like when you saw that ballot box being kicked around, in order to do that, you had to do it the old-fashioned way. There was types of voting called chain voting, where you would have a blank ballot and you'd fill it out and then you'd hand it off to the next guy and the next guy. And so there was ways of paying for votes. But it involved hundreds of people colluding in order to do this. The way that we're dealing with the voting systems now is that if you have access, if you can manage to get access, then you can influence all of it all simultaneously. So it provides you with an opportunity to affect it on a broad scale. If you're working for the vendor themselves and you're manufacturing that software that's going into the voting systems, then you have the opportunity not even just to affect it on your state level or on your county level, but you can affect it nationally. So it's a huge um, availability to the potential of corruption. And it, as we know, it's nearly impossible to prevent or to detect it. So I call it the perfect crime. It c occurs invisibly. You can actually, as you said earlier, you can write self-modifying code that actually would, um, it, it would self-destruct after it, after it executed. The weapon is the part of the regular tool set, so we don't have to worry about, you know, the, your weapons are compilers and code and all that sort of stuff. So we don't have to worry about the smoking gun left lying around. Oh, he had a Microsoft C compiler. Well, a lot of people have that. So it's, you know, they're not really going to be able to accuse you of that. Um, potential suspects are allowed to tamper with the crime scene before the evidence is collected. And you'll see on a subsequent slide the business about the election officials. The election officials have access to all of this stuff. So if they want to, they can cover up the crime. Um, critical evidence is going to be prevented from disclosure. My assumption is that if, they do, if you do wind up having one of those statements written in, in you know, in the gobbledygook <laughs> language in the, in the uh, um, write-in vote, they're going to try to cover that up as best as possible. So you got to make sure that that gets disclosed. Um, but we'll, we'll try to make sure that it happens for you too, <laughs> if you tip us off. Um, the problem is that a lot of the evidence is hearsay. It's not from the original source. The prosecutors are false in the line. In other words, the people who are actually, like myself, people who are concerned about this, get criticized, and the incorrect suspects are being charged. People often are criticizing a local election official who unfortunately bought this stuff because the vendors told them that it was safe and the state certified it and it was federally certified. There's a lawsuit going on right now in South Florida with Miriam Oliphant of Broward County and she's being accused of having spent too much money to run the elections. Unfortunately, what she wasn't told was she was going to have to spend that much money to run the elections because the machines were so fouled up. So that, in my opinion, is the perfect crime. So in the perfect crime, remember there's motive and there's opportunity. So we have 
have motive and we have opportunity by the election administrators. People who are in power in the election system, pol politicians, are the people who are running the elections. And as we know, power corrupts. Well, maybe not to everybody, but for a lot of people it does. And so the point is, is that they got elected in a partisan way using the election system. And this is why you don't see people up on Capitol Hill very much, except for Rush Holt and a few other Congress people who are really concerned about this. And by the way, Rush Holt is also a geek because he's a degreed physicist. But in any event, the types of people who are speaking out about this are few and far between because most of the people know that they got elected from some weirdly corrupt voting system. And so they don't really want to rock the apple cart or they might not be in office too much longer. So <laughs> <laughs> and it is true. So the rest of the interest is in remaining in control or passing control to like-minded individuals. That's the idea. And we know this from studying political science that this has basically been the way that the United States and other so-called democratic governments have been perpetuating themselves. So any type of election system that's relying on procedural or valuatory controls, in other words, these types of bogus inspections, these types of what they call logic and accuracy tests, oh, we're going to test the machine before the election and make sure that it works. All of that stuff, if it's being conducted by election administrators, then it is inherently corruptible because it's being done by the people who have the most to lose if they don't make sure that the system can do what they want it to do. So basically I call it the sort of hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil philosophy. And so for you, looking into ways that you can hack into the election, these are the types of things you're going to have to deal with. So first you should look for the smell test, okay? If it stinks, there's probably some problem there. Voting system standards contain the standards. These are the standards. And by the way, these standards are huge. They're like two, three hundred pages, boring, long sort of stuff. So make sure you have a lot of like intoxicating beverages when you're reading these things. Okay, and I read these things. So <laughs> you just imagine what it must be like. But in any event, <laughs> So the voting system standards contain this loophole. And by the way, I am a part of the Institute of Electoral Electronics Engineers, the IEEE Voting System Standards Working Group. And we are working with the vendors on creating these things. And every time we get to something that could potentially lock up one of these backdoors or loopholes, they start having a fight with us. Like we've had for months fights over should wireless be used in a voting machine? And I can't get them to agree that that is not a good idea. They keep saying, oh, wireless is secure. So I go, okay, well tell me which sort of wireless you're going to use. Or at least specify what wire, what secure wireless technology you're going to use in the voting machine. Oh no, that would be implementation specific. We can't put any implementation specific things in the standard. We should just say that it has to be a secure wireless technology. Okay, so any of you know a secure wireless technology? <laughs> I don't think so. But in any event, those are the types of, so you look in the standards, and the standards have these back doors in them, so wherever that stuff is in there, then that's the stuff that you can do to hack to, into the voting system. So the back doors are in auditing. In security, in configuration management, it's, you know, sort of like, you know, propagating the system. So, oh, by the way, when they inspect these systems, it's not like, like when you inspect a car. Imagine that in Detroit, they just inspect five cars, and then all the cars get an inspection sticker of that model forever. You never have to inspect them ever again. I mean, this is ridiculous. So if that's the way these inspections are done. The inspections are not done per voting machine. And in many places, they don't actually inspect them again in the states or when they buy them. So the configuration management is, OK, here's the one that was inspected. How do we know that the one that was received is actually the same? Testing, manufacturing, that type of thing. And then you heard mention earlier about cryptography. They use all these words, techno hype. It's this sort of you know like use of you know, electronic audit trails, we have advanced cryptography. What the heck do they, are they even talking about this? The election officials, do, they're clueless. They don't have an idea what any of this means. We know what it means. And so when you see these techno hype boards, basically just come up with some other gobbledygook of your own, and you should be able to defeat that pretty easily. The procedures that they use are also very, very lax. You heard mention of the business about, um, you know, the little sticky tape and, you know, the secure tape and also like these little you know, wire ties. It's all hugely lax. I'll give you a reference to an article where you can find this. 
Um, so anyway, well, that was the smell test. This is the eyeball test. The eyeball test is basically if the voting system company has done insecure things, like Debold and Sequoia have left their source code floating out there on the web. So my suspicion would be that they have sort of lax procedures and protocols for protecting their stuff. Vote here, again, the company that I mentioned who said that they um, are offering up their software for people to review. Their server was actually attacked. Maybe it was one of you who did that. If so, that's really wonderful. Um, but <laughs> in any event, their server was attacked. And so those types of companies who we know are vulnerable to this type of stuff would be vulnerable to these types of things. Um, as, as we said, the use of cryptography has been inappropriately applied, and you can find documentation about that. And then this business about the backdoor's COTS, which is commercial off-the-shelf software products, are granted blanket ex exemptions from any sort of certification examinations. I'm going to give you the example in a minute about the COTS stuff. And, the, and basically, if you use a Windows operating system, as some of them do, it doesn't have to be certified because it's COTS. You can get it commercially off the shelf. A lot of the voice modules that they're using for the blind to read out, those are COTS voice reading modules. Um, a lot, you know, even the printer modules, printer drivers, if it's a COTS thing and you can purchase it, purchase it commercially off the shelf, then it does not have to be inspected. So there you go. There's all your back doors for you. Um, and then finally, what I call the taste test. It, there are hundreds, literally hundreds on the website. There's various websites, a lot of them are linked on my website, a lot are linked on her website, of examples of hundreds of voting system malfunctions. So if you're going to attack something, attack one that you know to be vulnerable in a place where you know they've had problems before. There's, you know, these malfunctions were reported throughout the spring primary season, and literally, as I said, there were hundreds of these things reported, especially over the last couple of years. The uncertified software was used in California and also in India. Now, supposedly, that's been corrected, but even though it was uncertified, we don't know, you know what they're doing to have better software in there. And believe it or not, I mean, anybody who is you know, a reliability expert, you don't take your things out for the first dry run on the most important election of the decade. And so a lot of, <laughs> yay, a lot of the counties, they're not able to get their stuff in here for the spring primary, so they are going to take brand new, out of the box, new voting systems that have not seen actual use in real elections and they're going to be using them in November. So find out where those counties are. I would suspect those would be ones to look at. Um, this Rama Technologies report, I'm going to get to that in a second, um, but the Rama Technologies report was done in Maryland by an independent firm that was paid money to actually try to attack the debug system and it's a great thing. Um, it's a great report because it gives you sort of the blueprint of how to attack the default the default system but yet the recommendation, and I really, I had a lengthy email exchange with Red Harmer, the, the lead guy who was investigating this. I said, so you came up with all these flaws, and then your recommendation was to put tamper-proof tape upon the ports? I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. So uh, their recommendations were not really very secure. And so you can go right into the Robo report, and it'll tell you how to go through the USB port and, you know, just use one of those, you know, thumb drives to add additional votes or to add additional stuff <laughs> right at the polling place there. So all that sort of stuff, it's all available, the information's all out there. So anyway, I'll refer you to that as well. And then the final part is really the business about accuracy. Um, we know that every vote doesn't count. And these lost votes that are floating around is in the range of about 3 to 5 percent at every single election. And these exceed the manufacturer's stated error rates. They're only supposed to, according to the standards, lose like one vote in every 54,000, which is still a considerable number of votes, but it's much lower than 3 to 5 percent. And our data has really shown that what they call this residual or lost vote rate is much higher than anybody really has recognized. And it's in, across all types of machines, that are, as I'll show you in a second. When they do the testing, they do it on pristine data sets. So they use perfect cards or perfectly marked optically scanned ballots. Or when they're doing the touch screens, do you think they touch the screen to cast the test votes? No, they use a little cartridge and they 
test it through the cartridge. So this doesn't test anything. So this business about accuracy, I'm not going to get into the business about residual vote rate, but this is the type of accuracy we were getting in the California recall election. And you can see, yeah, it looks like the touch screens are better than the punch cards, but actually, in some cases, they were better. In some cases, they were actually worse. And one of the best systems in California is the data vote punch card, where it actually sucks the chad right out of the hole. And that's a really good system. It's also extremely cheap, and they don't have to spend billions of dollars to buy new ones. But nobody's talking about using that. In any event, that's the type of error rates that we're getting. So the cool thing was, was I was up at Yale, and they had this big debate among, like, you know, real high-tech gurus, undergraduates. And they, they got to go, but they were at Yale. So, but in any event, so they, you know, it's not, you know, not even at MIT. But if these were undergraduate computers, they were really good students, really. I should put them down. Really good super students at Yale in the computer science department. Um, but the point is, is that they actually theoretically demonstrated that you, if you only change one vote per precinct, they did this sort of a mathematical analysis, one vote per precinct, and you can imagine either one machine per precinct or maybe two machines per precinct. So they ran it out with a number of different numbers. But one vote per machine, you could think of it that way. If you just change one vote per precinct, in a close election nationwide, you can actually shift the electoral college votes, because remember, we don't vote for the president, we vote for the electoral college. You can actually shift the electoral college, like has happened in Florida, from one candidate to another. So that's all you would really have to do to demonstrate that. So in order to hack the election 2004, you don't have to hack too much. And it's going to be in the error rate, and it would be undetectable. It'll be in the level of the noise. It will be undetectable. So so basically what I'm saying is his challenge, Seamus' challenge, is doable. All you have to do is make sure that one vote per machine is swapped from one candidate to another. If we have a close election, it will change the outcome of the election. So very good results there with the Yale people. That's my email address, and you have this flyer, and I have websites linked to mine. And if you go on my site, the eVote.html, you can just go to NotableSoftware.com and then click on the electronic voting button. That gives you all the information about, you know, voting, that sort of stuff. Let me just give you, show you where this business about the Robert Technologies Report, and then take, we're both going to take questions. Um, this Robert Technologies Report, very easy to find. Oops, I just closed it. Crap. All right, sorry about that. Um, this Robert Technologies report is available on the web, and it's got it page after page. It's only like 23 pages. Here it is. The Debar Acumen TS voting system. Let me go down to. Let me go down here. So it actually shows you exactly how you can influence with the. Key cards, the just sliding down here, shows you exactly what you can do. I just wanted to read this really great paragraph. So you know, here's the sticky tape. This is your recommendation. Secure, <laughs> secure access with this little st piece of sticky tape. I like that. That's really good. We will probably buy them on the internet. Here's the gem server. And, and um, Bev has spent a lot of time with the gem server. It's just, I love this one. This is really great. OK. It, the team demonstrated the following. And by the way, they didn't take months or you know even like years to demonstrate. Some of these things that they demonstrated were demonstrated in like as little as five minutes. And in addition to all the passwords being the 1111, they also found that the physical keys, there were like 16,000 machines and each had two or three keys, all the keys were identical. Now, you know, I didn't have to wonder about that. Like, if you ordered keys from a locks making company, you would have to actually, I would think that the default would be that they give you different keys, right? You would think. But I would think you would have to specifically ask for all the keys to be exactly the same. Or some bozo did that. So all you had to have was one key, and you could open up any voting machine because they all have the exact same physical key. This is ridiculous. But in any event, the only read about the Gem server. It says the Gem server lacks critical security updates from Microsoft. Again, it's COTS. It's a it's a server using a Microsoft standard product that you can buy commercially off the shelf. There's no requirement that you do an update. And I love this when I read this. It says, as a result, the team successfully exploited a well-known vulnerability using a software product known as Canvas. Probably a lot of you know what that is. This vulnerability, described in a security advisory from Microsoft, for which a patch was made available on July 16, 2003, allows a remote attacker to get complete control of the machine. 
mean? Since this is the same weakness that the August 11, 2003 blaster worm exploded, it means that if the gem server was exposed to an environment where blaster was propagating, it might have been infected. Now, it wasn't, it's not the blaster so much that was bad. It's after it gets infected by blaster, there's, as you probably all know, there's a thing that rides on top of a blaster infected thing that now exploits the blaster hull that's in, that's been blasted into it. So by just successfully directing canvas at the gems, what is it, so modem, uh, yeah, I think it was modem interface. The teams was the team was able to remotely, yeah, it was the modem. We were able to remotely upload, download, and execute files with full system administrator privileges. All that was required was a valid phone number for the gem server. So this is the type of thank you very much. This is the type of thing that's actually going on inside of these systems, and nobody's doing anything to control or protect this type of stuff. So this is a great thing you can search for, it's the RABA report, just search for RABA Technologies, Wertheimer, you'll find it, I might even have it linked to my website, but it's, it's very easily accessible. And this is the type of thing that's out there. So we're not talking about something that is impossible to do, it's very, very possible to hack these systems. And I'm encouraging people to at least do some sorts of demonstrations if you can, even do them at your county. See if you can get your county to allow you to do this like you did. You went in there legitimately and you just talked the guy through so that he actually saw how it was possible to go in through a back door. I think people need to start doing that and we need to start getting in touch with the people who are in charge of this stuff and letting them know all of this is occurring. So I, I'm really enlisting your support. I hope you'll help me with this. We'll make sure that hopefully you do get arrested, but we want, really want to make sure that people get the word out there and really try to find out um, what's going on inside of these systems so that then we can sort of stop this and then go to some sort of sane way of running elections. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that really a standing ovation over there? Man, I, I've been a guitarist for most of my life, and I have never gotten a standing ovation. Thank you very much. That, really, <laughs> that makes me feel great. So anyway, now we'll take questions. So we'll be happy to answer your questions. And um, So you, you, know, you might as well start. Go ahead. Right, Lyndon Johnson, yeah. I wonder if you've noticed any correlation between the people in the encounter on the staffing crews who are resisting putting in stronger systems to direct them and the location that the story was passing in the last few years. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, you, what you're saying, you're, the question is essentially, have I noticed any correlation between the people in the standards groups and the locations in which they happen to reside or work? Um, that, that's a very interesting question, and uh, you can answer it too. But from my own personal standpoint, again, I've been working this for 15 years. Very early on, I noticed that it was not the people who were working on it per se, but the locations in which they were deployed and the places in which there were reported problems. And again, these problems go back decades, even with the electronic stuff that was around in the 80s. And what I noticed, and I didn't stay awake too much during high school civics, but I have to say that I stayed awake long enough to know where the civil rights problems were, and it was just astonishing to me to, you know, Dade County and all these places where there had been civil rights problems are the places that seem to be uniformly employing these types of technologies and also having the problems with them. Now, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, um, who I did testify for, the C-SPAN actually broadcast the testimony, um, the, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights is very concerned about this, and they have issued numerous reports. I should tell you that whenever they talk about voting in their hearings, in the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights hearings, the Republicans get up and walk out. They don't want to talk about it. But they do hold the hearings anyway, even with them out of the room. And they, in their hearings, 
Institutions, and in their booklets, they have various studies that they have done, some fairly huge and extensive studies. They, there is a correlation between the places in which these machines are being used. I mean, it's like some of them, they show a map of the United States, and it's like we're fighting the Civil War. It's like North versus South. And that was very astonishing to me, because I didn't realize that it was as predominant as it actually is, and that it's sort of like a high-tech, what I call like a high-tech literacy test. It's a new way of creating a literacy test that is a technology type of literacy test, even if it's just that technology is harder to use by people who really don't have access to technology, but the problems and the things, the denial of service that seems to be endemic, seems to be in those same counties. Again, hard to prove, but the U.S. Commission of Civil Rights, just contact them, they can provide you with that data. Um, oh, that's you, wanna, you answered it. Good. Okay, cool. Plus, I don't know if my mic works. Oh, oh yeah, it's working very well. It's working very well. You, you recognize people. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, okay, white shirt, black shirt, okay. <laughs> white and then black. <laughs> the Avante system, and they actually, um, they are certified. It wasn't in Santa Clara? Or oh, it might have been uh, open voting. It was the open software group. Open That's right. It was yeah. the open software group. Oh, remember, evil. Open software. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, the open software group actually did demonstrate it too. But also Avante um, is actually certified. Open software group stuff is not certified yet to my knowledge. You can correct me, but I'm fairly mm -hmm. certain not. It costs about a million dollars to get a new product certified, and it takes about a year to two years to get it certified. Avante's system was demonstrated in California, and they are certified. Um, they, you have to be federally certified and then state certified. So there are a number of paper ballot products that are legitimate out there that are actually um, certified and, and, and out there. So, and the Open Software Group is planning on doing that as well. So, um, I don't know about that. Well, I, well, we should take with somebody. I'm sorry, we really did want to get, we want to have to get somebody on the left. How about you? <laughs> The vote really? by mail? It takes away some of that like, high intensity period that you were talking about. Um, absentee and vote by mail is unfortunately very vulnerable. Um, it wouldn't need to be, but they don't have a particular method of tracking the train of ch of chain of custody. And what's more disturbing is in the urban areas, they outsource, uh, they will get all these ballots in, in, in my county about 600,000. They come into the post office and then it turns it over to a private company um, and then the private company then turns it over, sorts it into its precinct so it knows where the ones are, gives it to the elections division and at no point do they count the ballots to make sure that the same number of ballots is going through the system. So the easiest way to tamper with that would be to disappear ballots in key precincts. No right. one would ever know. And that, that is true. Any, any type of um, absentee balloting, even if it's like on the internet, can also be subject to vote selling coercion. Um, but I have spoken with the Secretary of State of Oregon, and he is happy with that. Um, people in Oregon don't tend to talk to each other too terribly much. So it does seem to work for Oregonians, and they are actually happy with it. Um, the thing that I, that, you know, I do agree with what you're saying. Um, one system that I did see that was demonstrated by Pitney Bowes, and they're, you know, like the people who sell like you know the the you know the mail the electronic mail sort of you know like the stamps electronic stamps and things like that. They actually have a very nice system which is end to end. You can actually trace back if they if the if the person the election official says that we mailed you your ballot, you can actually prove through this Pitney Bowes system that it actually was mailed. So there are ways to do this correctly, and I have sort of urged Pitney Bowes. A lot of people don't know about it, and I don't know that they've sold very many of them. One of the great things about I have happen to vote absentee now because I, they also put these crazy. systems in, in my area. So one of the things about voting absentee is that you don't, uh, you, if you're voting early, you can actually go to the place where you drop it off. And I physically dropped off my ballot and handed it off to somebody. Now, I know when my vote wasn't correct. I know I handed it off. I don't know what happens to it when it finally gets What's in What's also very important, by the way, is once, you, once the votes finally arrive, the absentee ballots, they're counted by the gem system, the central tabulator. Yeah. And they're not counted by hand. They go <laughs> through the machine. <laughs> yeah, so the, the same problems exist. And there's a whole host of different things. There are great, I don't need to put down 
photography or you know any of these high tech approaches. There are some really great high tech approaches and appropriate uses of technology where you would scan a ballot in and it would get a cryptographic seal on it so it couldn't go mislaid and things like that. So there are things that we have suggested to try to assure that the ballots are the way they are intended and that they get received the way and counted the way that they're intended. Unfortunately, again, the vendors are not going towards those things. But you'll see 